Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Los Angeles Public Library's Facebook and YouTube Live channels for another amazing program for kids and families. Today, we have a wonderful program about um, the nature that we can find all around us here in Los Angeles. I know we live in a big city, and we might think that nature is far away from us, but really we live with it, we live in it, and we have some amazing parks in our neighborhoods and also in our greater Southern California region, including uh, the Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area. Today we have a very special uh, park ranger from the Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area to tell us a little bit more about the nature around us. So without further ado, let me bring on Ranger Oliveras, yay! <laughs> How's it going, everyone? Hey there, hey there. <laughs> so as far as uh, who I am, right? Um, thank you all for those that are, are viewing this right now live. I'm like, whoa, virtualness, like distance learning and all that. So with that being said, for the time that I have with you all, again, I wanted to uh, just introduce myself. My name is Ranger Adalí Olivares. And I am a park ranger with the National Park Service. And I specifically work at your local national park site here if you reside in the local Southern California area. Also, not too far away from neighborhoods, communities in Ventura County, um, Oxnard, Thousand Oaks, Newberry Park, those areas, again, pretty close by to some of our lands. But again, I just want to start off by just by showing you all again um, who I work with or as far as what agency I work with as far as overall so you might have seen this emblem beforehand if you've never seen this before hope you will be seeing that pretty shortly once you go into your travels into your local national park sites and so with this i really like to show this or start off any program just because this kind of captures our mission really captures kind of the cornerstone of our of our goals kind of our mission statement as as park rangers as guarda parques and so with that being said, why I say that is just even different components of this emblem of this crest from the shape of our crest here, of our, of our emblem that we actually have on all of our uniforms, a lot of our uniform items, this arrowhead shape representing the cultural resources that we preserve for future generations to learn about, kind of that legacy at each of these sites. Also within the image, other than just National Park Service, we also have a sequoia tree representing the vegetation that we conserve as well. Down below, we have our bison, our buddy bison down below, representing the wildlife that we take care of and conserve and protect. The mountains in the background representing the lands that we conserve, those scenic landscapes. And even the water, I'm like, where am I at? Where's my finger at? Even the water down below, that lake, grasslands, represent the recreational opportunities that you have when you go out and explore your public lands. May that be bird watching, may that be picnicking, may that even be bike riding, a number of things that you can do. And again, I work at a site closer to where I grew up at here in Southern California. I'm actually, I grew up in El Sereno in the Northeast side of Los Angeles. And uh, when I'm talking about some of these places, they may seem pretty far off in the distance, but in reality, they're a lot more closer than you think. And with these public lands, again, it's trying to figure out that way your own personal connection on how you connect to the nature that you find around you. And it doesn't always have to be out in a national park site, which again, there's about 400 plus national park sites found throughout the country. But even within that, just as much as Katie here, and thank you again to the LA Public Library for inviting me here to speak with you all, you can find nature, green spaces, public lands, a lot closer than you think. And you don't have to travel miles and miles away to find that biodiversity, that richness that's close to us. And so with that being said, I have a lot of information to share with you all. And I wanna thank you all again for being here today because I love to see any comments, any questions that, may come up, that might come up. And I'd love to answer them at the end of uh, my little presentation here. And so with that being said, thank you so much, Katie. I want to start off just um, welcome. Thank you. Gracias por todos, uh, everyone that's listening in here today. Uh, right here, I actually have an image of one of our iconic shots, that of an oak tree. If anyone's ever seen an oak tree, uh, you know how beautiful that they can be with those limbs stretching out across them. 
covering uh, kind of that lower area, providing shade, comfort, and whatnot for critters down below, or even for people trying to read a good book out in nature. But also in the back are tri peaks, that kind of that iconic or that scenic landscape that we have. And so from here, if I can have you please change the next slide there. Thank you so much, Katie. What we have is really, where is this place? Where is this located? Where are you working at, Ranger Libades? And so, as you can see kind of in this map, a little bit of details here and there, but the boundary line of the Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area extends upon acre and acre, goes out all the way out west to those Oxnard Plains. And also closer than you think, near Los Angeles, near LA, right in Runyon Canyon, if you've ever visited that with your family, Franklin Canyon, Topanga State Park, several green spaces, several parks that you see highlighted in that map, all lie within the Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area. But again, on top of that, what I want you to focus on a little bit more so is that if you veer kind of closer off to the right-hand side, or maybe it might be your left, <laughs> on, on your screen, Los Angeles and how close that is, our city so close by, and really, again, not standing out too far away from us. And when I think about this, really brings up another question. If you can change that slide for me, please, Katie. Is that when we think about this area and these lands, how much has changed? And these images here that are actually coming from an archive source from the LA Public Library, not the library, I'm not sure if you all are aware of this, you can actually view these uh, even right after this program here with your parents or their guardians, is that these images up here might bring up this time of a distant past. Like if we're going, stepping back into time, what our city might have even looked like. And even then, I do want to give a shout out again. We are, for those that are tuning in from Los Angeles, from LA, knowing that we are on the ancestral lands of the Tongva, Gabrielino, Kizfo, the people's ancestral lands of our, our um again, our indigenous folk here, still again present today, as far as with their descendants, and we still work with them even when we have presentations and programming. But when we think about how much the land has changed, again, even with Los Angeles, not always being known as Los Angeles or a pueblo, even also known at some point in time as Yangna. But when we think about stepping back into time, how much has this place changed and really its interaction with that of the city and wildlands coming together. The images that I have here are actually from the 1930s, all stemming from different, kind of around the same time period. But on one end, kind of the larger image that you see there is actually shot out, as shot from um, the Griffith Park area. You see a little bit of that waterway of the LA River making its way through those lands. The top right shot that you see there, the image that you see, that photo, is actually a view of the Los Angeles River prior to it being completely full or pretty much covered with concrete. And you can see a little bit about those waterways kind of taking its own shape, even flooding or subduing some of those areas you can find along those arroyos of the LA River. Even that of pretty much, right, the images of kind of how we got around or transportation. Maybe might not be kind of the fastest car there, but you see kind of an old timey view. But these, vote, these photos, again, are all coming from about 100 years in the past. But one thing that I do want to note within each of these photos or why I bring this up, what ties these things all together, for me anyways, as far as the story goes, is that aspect of nature and people coming together. May it be a figure that you see in the Griffith Park photo maybe potentially finding some time to reflect, maybe some time to just kind of get away or immerse themselves in nature. Or even with that of the shots of the Los Angeles River and how that's changed, how its course has been changed even then, even down below kind of this way of uh, that photo of the car crossing over the bridge, you know, what is to come next as far as folks, more the kind of a population, the amount of people that we have residing in this area. If you can please change that next photo for me, please, Katie. Thank you. Right, and kind of fast forward, bringing that kind of time travel, we're taking our DeLorean back to the present right now. Little shout out there. Uh, what we have, right, is this scene now today, 
where this photo here has this view from Griffith Park. You can see the observatory up top for those that have ever visited the site. It has a beautiful view of the cityscape, that skyline. And out in the center there, you have, some of you might already know this already, is downtown Los Angeles or LA. And really seeing, again, that combination of these green spaces, nature, living right alongside the city or a lot of the development. And we're talking about different things. And you might already have these answers already, even by looking outside in your neighborhood, if you can safely do so, you could see streets, concrete. You have a lot of development from large buildings being constructed to really areas where you have a lot of folks coming back and forth, going back and forth. But when I was starting to develop this program, really looking at the nature part of it and also that of the development of the city coming together, it really made me think about what other life do we have around us? Because again, looking back at those images of the past and not too long, not too distant, even though they have that black and gray kind of view of that black and white tone, only about a hundred years ago, how much things have changed over time and really how some things, let's say like our nature neighbors or even a lot of this vegetation, how it's managed to survive even till today. When we created these roads, when we paved these, over, paved these rivers, how has that affected a lot of the things that might have called this home, not just people, but call this area home even before all these changes were to happen? And it really made me think as far as what work we do now at the Santa Monica Mounds with the National Park Service here, what studies are going on? How are we learning from all these resources that we have around us? And if I can have the next photo, please, Katie. Thank you. We have images, again, of nature and development or the city coming together. So this photo, why I bring this up, you can see here some of our, our even our the park rangers tuning in, our junior rangers tuning in, we use those abilities, right? Analyzing the photo, looking down and seeing, all right, what is going on in this image? Some of you already have the answer, right? What are we seeing? If you want to write down some comments. What we have here, that kind of looks like a dog, right? Has that kind of bushy tail, has those pointy ears. I wonder. If only we had a critter that could help me out. And luckily for me, I have a friend here to help me out. What am I looking at, right? So those pointy ears, that bushy tail, that kind of grayish, brownish fur. Hmm. All those things, all those identifiers letting me know, and some of our junior rangers are already tuning in right now, you have the answer here, is that with all of that put together, we have a coyote. And a coyote, but what is a coyote doing here? It's not in this kind of desert landscape. It's not in the mountains. It's not in this huge grassy field. But Junior Rangers, everyone tuning in here today, right? What we have is not mountains, a desert, or kind of a different view out in the wild. But what we have is a coyote roaming the streets of Los Angeles. We have, again those vehicles safely trying to cross that streetway. And it really makes me think as far as what other nature neighbors we have that live around us. And again, the, even then, the nature that we have right outside our doorstep. And so from there, I, I also think about the work that our, 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 that our wildlife biologists do those that study these movements of these critters going from one place to the next, where they don't only just stay in the mountains, but again, that find homes or have always called this place home, but how do they maneuver? How do they manage to weave in and out and to survive alongside so many people, so many buildings, so many roadways? And from there, even then, how do we manage to get this information? I would love to say that maybe I took this photo where I just stood in a place ready to get that shot at that perfect moment, but I would be lying to you 
because again, there are different methods, different ways that our other rangers in the park and other friends and colleagues that I have that manage to get this information and share with us really to see what nature neighbors we have around us. And so I'm gonna show, uh, Katie, if you can please bring up uh, that clip up for me. Just to let our folks know here, again, some of the studies that we have going on that might not only just focus on coyotes, but might look at other critters as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Hopefully that came to everyone's um, everyone's screen there. And it was a view that we had there. Um, it was actually footage from wildlife cameras that we have placed throughout various areas throughout our mountains there. Our wildlife biologists would place that. And that is one huge way to know really as far as what animals we have crossing in an area where they might be calling home and how they maneuver around and uh, really a uh, when I've done a program before, someone made a great point as far as what are these animals doing here exactly? And even then when we get that information, someone broke it down to me in three parts, right? We're looking at what these animals are needing to survive, water, food, and shelter or a home. Just as much as when we see mountain lions, and some of you might be already familiar with a certain popular Hollywood puma or Hollywood mountain lion, P22, and it's called Griffith Park Home, and really how it has adapted to being so close to so many people. But again, what's the purpose or how did it manage, how did this critter manage to uh, call this place so close home? Looking for food, water, and shelter can be huge pieces to that puzzle. And especially when we have information getting, uh, we gain that again from either footage, either from sightings, or even looking at patterns. Uh, again, getting that information, getting that live footage from those cameras goes a long way in learning a bit more of that mystery of how that critter got there and what exactly it's doing. But I don't want you all to forget, right, as far as how this critter randomly has gotten here or how it's strange it might be, when we talk about how things have changed over time in Los Angeles, kind of really kind of takes out a little bit of that where we're talking about that mystery of what is it doing here? Well, actually these places prior to any highways or freeways kind of blocking access to other public lands, an area like this, or even out in Griffith Park, wouldn't it be too strange to find a mountain lion roaming around looking for food. And again, other ways that we can find information that we can gain some knowledge. This is actually not a real skull, it's more of a plaster, is really looking at again, what type of food or what type of things, sustenance, things that allow them to survive, things that they're feeding on. We can gain some of that information by learning a little bit more about even just the anatomy of a critter, how it's adapted to its home. And so here I have a skull, again, a plaster skull of a mountain lion. And I always like to kind of use this double kind of uh, back to back to get some idea of skull sizes. The one on my left hand here is that of a mountain lion. And this one here, this skull is actually that of a pit bull. So when you took it, when you look at the sizes or even kind of its features from those huge canines that this critter has, how it differentiates between some of the species that actually are a little bit closer, right? Than we think, and especially when we're talking about Los Angeles. And so if I can get that slide back up or that presentation, thank you so much, Katie. What other critters call Los Angeles home or even this area or evidence that we have of these folks or these animals that live close by. And so just on this image really quickly, what we see here, again, all evidence that we've captured either through wildlife cameras or just again, field studies that our wildlife biologists go out to. We have our 
mule deer up on my right top screen there. We have mule deer, we have gray foxes, we have evidence of California newts, red tail hawks, and again, those mountain lions. So we have all these critters here call this area nearby here in Southern California home. And as you see, some of those things that link those connections between all of these critters, and they're relatively close. They're so close again to us here in Los Angeles. And this large amount of biodiversity that we have around us, or the amount of life, the variety of life that we have around us, extends into the hundreds from the animals, to the plants that we have growing around us, the trees, the vegetation, all that we have so close to us. So this next part of this program, though, I do want to say is I wanted to focus on three different types of critters that shows us how they manage to adapt, meaning all these changes that are happening around them what are those things that how they react to certain situations when they're looking either for food, water, or shelter, how they can manage to survive alongside so many folks, so many structures, even with their surroundings being changed again, not so much overnight, but gradually, right? Over year after year after year. And it really made me think and focus on when I was growing up, animals that piqued my interest, things that at some point I was thinking about, huh, I wonder how this critter itself might have survived. And so each of these have kind of a little personal touch, and that's why I selected them for you, for you all today. And so can I have the next slide on that presentation, please? So I would love to always see um, when my mom would always point out kind of the wildlife that I had around me growing up again in El Sereno. And for me, one of the things that she always loved to see was uh, kind of a flying critter that some of you might be already familiar with, that of the hummingbirds, the colibris. And there was that personal connection for me to see this little critter, tiny, zooming around, flying around me. And to think in the neighborhood, close to the city, how is this animal managing to survive? And even then, how do scientists or biologists or even then ornithologists, those that study birds, how do they break it down to notice how this critter manages to survive? And actually, how do they label that critter? And so you can see on your screen, I'll read that off for you. This animal is actually known specifically the animal down on the right there, the little small kind of with orange plumage on its neck is known as an Allen's hummingbird. And some of you might have already seen this critter. It's actually been seen out in up north in Santa Barbara, all the way down can be found also to San Diego. Even for those that might have familia or know someone out in Riverside or even here in Los Angeles, it's a pretty common bird to find. It's also known as the kind of a fat, one of the fastest couch potatoes that we have around us. And one of the things on why it's kind of gained that label and kind of goes to that hyper adapter species is that this animal in any kind of given situation. If we didn't have all these folks around here, if we didn't have this large city built, this critter would actually have to travel just much like a lot of other birds in the nearby area will have to migrate and move around and go from here and travel thousands of miles to potentially find food or even water or shelter. But how things have changed so much and why it has that word or that title, that label, hyper adapter, is that it does so well living close to people. And I wonder, you might already have this answer, Junior Rangers, you might already have this answer, but just by looking at these images, what are some things that you see already, right? And I'll, I'll briefly just kind of bring that up, is that we have those beautiful flowers where this critter is getting that nectar from. Also kind of a, a, a fun fact that hummingbirds also eat smaller gnats, smaller insects. That's how they manage to get some of their strength as well, not just only with nectar. But also on the other side, you have something that's maybe not so much nature related, but something that you might even see at a store. You might also see in one of the local gardens around you, maybe or even at your house. Maybe your parents put up a garden, put up kind of this bird feeder, this bird water, uh, this kind of tube. So again, looking back at that name, hyper adapter, 
hummingbirds, like let's say that of the Allen's hummingbird, do extremely well around folks, around people, because of the fact that we live in a Mediterranean type of ecosystem here. We have great weather year round, or we have even in summer, kind of those dry, hot summers, or in winter time, or even as we're leaving, for example, right now, we have more of that chilly, cool, wet kind of season, but we don't have those extremes where it gets too hot or too cold, kind of down the middle. And we're looking at places, especially in cities, where you have a good amount of folks, gardens galore, right? To them, to these hummingbirds, it seems like there's a huge buffet right in front of them, or also to the point where you have water that's left out for you. So when you're thinking about, does this critter really have to move around to survive? When we're thinking about this Allen's hummingbird or colibris, not so much. So they've managed to adapt to their surroundings. They've changed it up a bit where they don't have to travel thousands of miles away to survive. And really, hey, there's all this food out here. It's all this water out here. I could probably find a nice corner where I can rest and uh, be ready to go the next day. Really allows this critter to take advantage of, of really the resources that they have around them. But now to switch a little bit of gears, what if you have kind of, again, if you're looking more so as an animal that might not just always have to stay in one area, but might have to move around I want to look at that part, at that migration part, that migratory species. And so if you can please change that next slide. Or actually, you know what? <laughs> I, that's on me. I forgot the orientation. We're going to look at the other side of the spectrum. What about a critter that doesn't have a buffet in a sense, where it's seen maybe more so as a threat? So here again, bringing up our, our friend the coyote is actually deemed as a survivalist. And so for this program or why, you know, this is labeled a survivalist, just like the opposite of our Allen's hummingbird, we're looking at a critter that is a meso predator or a medium sized critter. So a little bit different, right? That skull structure than the, than the mountain lion, but on the opposite side, this medium sized predator known as our survivalist, where pretty much kind of its namesake survives alongside large populations, large amounts of folks around them. And one thing that I want to bring up, kind of that personal connection for me, when I was growing up in El Sereno, one of the things that was pretty uncommon for me to hear would hear those howls in the background, either hearing that noise that a coyote was nearby, or even then, but on the early morning when I was getting ready to go out with my parents somewhere, would be seeing a coyote out in broad daylight. And for some, again, that might be something that's really rare or uncommon, but maybe some of you all have seen maybe a coyote out as you're traveling throughout our beautiful city here, right? And so one thing I want to point out, kind of that personal connection is wondering, how do these critters manage to survive here close to so many people. Well, one thing that I wanna bring up, or a couple of things before we move on to our next species, is that with this animal, we're looking at that those things, right? Food, water, and shelter. Those things that drive this critter to move around from one place to the next. And for me, it's really looking at the, the wide variety of food sources that this critter manages to survive off of. It's number one food source, I will say, because I know there's a lot of myths or kind of this understanding or misunderstanding of this critter is that this critter wants to eat your cat, wants to eat your dog, which I would say to you from different studies that have happened is that this critter actually prefers smaller kind of wildlife rodents. So we're talking about cottontail rabbits, pocket gophers mice that they might find out in those grassland areas or open spaces. But when you're thinking about this more medium-sized critter, kind of a little bit bigger, right, than our Allen's hummingbird, we're looking at a critter that if they can't find that food source, they're going to be looking for something else. Maybe not so much like a skunk that we have. We have our little pellet here. But so I'm going <laughs> to zoom on in. So we, we use these furs, actually. This critter was not harmed um, by rangers. It was actually, these were donated to us. Or, uh, again, our 
little skunk critters here. So the coyotes are looking for something, let's say, like that of a skunk, right? Kind of has that defense mechanism. But I will say that what this critter will then eat if they can't find any cottontail rabbits, it extends that view on or at least looking at what they have available. And one of the things that some of you already know, these words as far as carnivores, herbivores, our coyotes are actually more so omnivores. And we can tell by that, right? They eat both plant life or again, protein, get that meat in. You can tell by some of their, their bone structure, at least their teeth structures, their molars, their canines. So this animal will actually eat on will feed on berries, lizards, can't find any of that around. They'll actually go after any uh, growing fruit. So some of you might have growing around your neighborhood, maybe oranges, maybe pitaya or dragon fruit, as some also call it. Um, also from their lake quads, anything that if you have hanging fruit around them could be a food source and something that you can see right there, maybe not something growing, but you have a coyote with a huge <laughs> slice of a watermelon in its mouth. So we're talking about really the food sources that any can anything again that they might have around them that doesn't make them use too much energy. They might be kind of uh, kind of looking at that from the corner of their eye. Like, do I want to feed on that? Because again, it's more so natural instinct. What it's eating is going to be more so those rodents again, or at least uh, cottontail rabbits, pocket gophers. That's going to be their main food source. And so that's, again, our survivalist species. And so the last critter that I want to share with you here today, again, is our migratory species. So kind of that personal touch, that personal connection is uh, ever wondered, you know, as far as when you go outside, kind of enjoying a beautiful day, just much like today. And you see that fluttering in the air, right? It's always breaking down. And even then, uh, when I was growing up, having those school projects and we're looking at a caterpillar's journey from cocoon, or at least from caterpillar to cocoon, um, to that eventual breakthrough, right? And so for me, when I look at the butterflies, you know, what speaks out to me the most are the monarch butterflies, have that distinct look, that kind of iconic view of those black and orange stripes on its body. And why, I've been bring, why I bring this up here, and how this critter manages to adapt to its surroundings, really looks at a couple of things. One of those things is the food source. Again, when we're talking about food and places where it can manage to grow year round or at least have enough of, a, of enough of an amount in a designated area works wonders for these critters. They might be traveling thousands of miles, up to 10,000 miles, for example. So I know with our butterflies, there's different groupings. Some of you might even know as far as it's uh, the travels that some of these groups start off from Mexico and might migrate off to the East Coast. We have other populations of monarch butterfly that actually don't really move too far away from Southern California that can be found up, uh, up along the coast area here. And there's also populations of monarchs that fly from down in Mexico, different parts, and fly all the way up to Oregon and Canada. And again, thousands of miles to go from one location to the next. But just like with us, whenever we go on long trips, or maybe even if it's not the longest trip, if you're visiting out your family from here to Ventura County or like Oxnard area, or from here out to the Inland Empire or anywhere, when we're talking about traveling, moving around, right? Sometimes either our belly start grumbling and we need to get some food along the way, or let's say if your parents, again, your guardians are driving down, sometimes we might need to get some gas to refuel and continue our journeys. So for cities and areas where you might have food just as much as with our Allen's hummingbird, there might be a buffet of plants that might be available for these critters traveling those long distances. And so one of those plant sources that they love, and as you can see from the state of the caterpillar to a full grown monarch, they love consuming milkweed. So that's that plant that you see there on those photos. So milkweed plays a huge role in their diet and really where they're getting that energy. And on that top view where I see, you see kind of that clump mass of monarch butterflies together, I wanted to point that out because again, as these butterflies are traveling and migrating, one way to keep themselves warm on those long cold nights 
there's coming together and kind of hoarding or coming together again, uh, bundled up in, an, in, a, in a branch or so forth. And they've actually called eucalyptus homes, um, cypress trees as well, as they're traveling from one location to next. So really looking at places where they can rest, where they can refuel and potentially get some food and continue on that journey. And places just like Los Angeles provide a couple of those resources for them to make a pit stop before they go to their next location. And so with that being said, kind of winds down our program here. I will say, um, and feel, uh, Katie, feel free to bring that down for me, please, and thank you, is that I just wanted to say briefly, I do want to provide some time, a couple of minutes to answer any questions that you all may have. Uh, but I do want to say that a lot of this information, a lot of what just even interest that I have looking at these critters, looking around at my environment and finding inspiration, a big piece of that was actually picking up a book. It's called Wild LA. And for me, it really inspired me to look into that journey and really look around us and see kind of these mysteries as far as like, or answer some of those questions that I already have. And I do want to say before I wrap up and before I forget, one of the things that I love about um, for myself, I've been a park ranger for some time now, over 10 years now, I managed to travel across the country um, I worked here. I've worked at Channel Islands National Park. I've worked out in El Paso, Texas, um, out at a site, the Chamisal National Memorial. And I've also worked out in Philadelphia, out in uh, at the Independence National Historical Park. But even with all those travels that I've had and now coming back home and working here out of the LA District Office for the Santa Monica Mountains has brought a new love that I have about discovering these green spaces that I have around me and those that are around my community. And if uh, I really wanna encourage you all and challenge you all to safely do so, given with the times right now, that um, these public lands are for you to enjoy. And whatever way that you can find that connection, you know, that's your own journey, that's your path to find that connection to the naturaleza, to the nature that we have around us. It's a beautiful thing as far as discovering new places that you can take your family out, and share that knowledge and share that information. And so I just wanna thank you all again, um, just for your time here today. And I'd love to answer any questions that you may have. I'm not sure if Katie, if you're seeing any questions on here, um, I'd love to answer, or if you have any questions for me, Katie. <laughs> I'm not seeing questions, but I have a question um, that I imagine will be useful to others. So uh, if you are a kid, right? Or a young person and you wanna get out there and see, a cool animal or a butterfly or whatever. Do you have recommendations for like how to get started observing animals around you? Mm, that's great. A great, great question. One of the things that for me, and I, I do want to point out if I, if I forgot to mention this is that with wildlife, right? That kind of like that word, right? Wild. One of the things that you want to look at is that, yeah, definitely we want to, um, we all want to see that kind of iconic shot or that view of these critters in front of us or kind of have that that moment where we see a mountain lion maybe for some you're like oh maybe i don't want to see a mountain lion but i will say is that um when you do go out to explore these areas again um to be mindful to have distance from the wildlife it's been cases and i've had questions from uh from kids from different schools right as far as even when we think about deer or critters that might not have those sharp fangs or those sharp teeth when we're talking about some of these critters is to be mindful that they're going to see a person coming closer and closer and closer to them. That's kind of scary, like kind of a threat, kind of like, Whoa, I need some distance. And so for me, probably the innovators of social distancing, they're like, just stay away from me. So I will say that you want to be mindful to view wildlife from a distance, take photos, right? Take those memories because you want to capture that. But again, having that safe distance, from yourself, from any of these critters. And some of the places that I would say, as far as if you're ever trying to see different types of birds, um, we have beautiful, uh, again, all this a large amount of wildlife around us. If you're trying to find those views of some of these critters, maybe just kind of like with people, you don't want to be out in the sun in the middle of the day, kind of feeling miserable. So really early mornings, kind of that, that dawn kind of time, or it's kind of as the sun setting, kind of that perfect time and especially one a great way that I tell folks, if you ever want to see wildlife, the less noise you make, the better. 
kind of any anything that won't scare off these critters away as they hear someone. And remember, even for let's say, even though this is in a, a real life rattlesnake, maybe some folks don't want to see any snakes or <laughs> any rattlers out on the trails. You got to think about if you're in a group of people and you're stomping down on a trail, some critters, just like rattlesnakes, for example, will hear that, will feel that rumbling on their bellies. Or again, uh, sometimes we lose sight of that. Just kind of our size, our presence can be kind of intimidating and scary to critters. Mm -hmm. So just slow down, you know, be calm and quiet and observe from a distance and maybe the, you know someone an animal will come to you <laughs> as more, not, not that you're tempting them over but just that they'll come across your path um mm. cool we do have one question uh do we have armadillos here in los angeles that's a good question that's a good question because right some of these critters um we, when we talk about hundreds of animals and all that stuff right when we break it down what exactly do we have here and I would say, as far as from my knowledge goes, unfortunately, armadillos are not native to the lands around us here. You might find them in other locations, you might find them even more so kind of, let's say, like the LA Zoo or something like that. But as far as critters that have struck me that were like, whoa, I didn't know that this existed here or called this place home. One of those is a, a badger. That was kind of like, I think I had a question before. It's like, have you ever seen a critter? I've, I've seen a badger out like at night on one of the trails. I've never seen a mountain lion. I think I've seen uh, the hind legs of bobcats. I have seen coyotes, deers, rattlesnakes, you know, a number of critters around here, but not an armadillo, unfortunately. And I don't recall them calling this place home. Mm -hmm. yep. Well, thank you so much. I think that's it for questions. Um, I did want to put a little plug in um, for right now at the library, if you're interested in nature and finding out more about the national parks and just getting out there um, and also learning about climate change and, and how we can protect our planet. Um, yeah. We have a challenge going on right now called the Celebrate Earth Challenge. Um, and you can find it at lapl.org slash spring, because it's spring. Um, and in there, there's lots of different activities you can do. And if you complete, I believe it's five of the activities, including uh, one mm -hmm. activity is checking out the, the National uh, Park Service website and planning, you know, what park would you like to go to one day? Um, if you complete some of those, you uh, will have the opportunity to win a number of really fun uh, prizes that are also biodegradable and <laughs> good for the environment <laughs> prizes, um, including um, a book called 50 Hikes with Kids California. So if you mm -hmm. are ready to get out into nature, that's definitely something you might be interested in. I, I will say just the last thing to, as we wrap up, um, I do want to say is uh, as far as kind of with, um, kind of as far as what next steps, right? And Katie, you bring up amazing points as far as um, climate change, conservation. One of the things, even if from, young to old, one of the things that I always like to tell any anybody that I come across, right, is that one of the best ways to um, take action or to be involved, one of the huge things is to bring awareness, to share the information today, um, even kind of anything that you learn today or as you go on out and explore your, your public lands or you go on a trail with a group of friends or family, you know, really sharing that knowledge and passing that along for others. I think is a huge way for folks to connect with their with their public lands, with their local national parks. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Um, and you know, hopefully, you'll take some knowledge from today, and you can share it with your family and your friends. Um, so, thank you so much. Uh, what a wonderful presentation! Um, and we will see you all uh, at our next program. So, have a good day, everyone. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>